All right, it's been a good while since we talked about carburetors. I think we've just been talking about brake systems lately. It's time to finally get back into the good stuff here on the channel and give brakes a break. I mean, I'm sure at this point you guys know how to fix every uh, brake system under the sun because it seems like that's what I've done this year. So right here I've got a 750 Holley, um, a big ass list of stuff we're gonna go over for base tuning procedure, how to set this truck up, a uh, list of anomalies, things to keep an eye out for, and then we're gonna get into carb functions here. This is uh, what I explained in the camper video about a year ago, but now I have dry erase markers. So I've touched on this a thousand times before, I'm just gonna touch on it real quick. When you buy a carburetor or a camshaft, there's three options for a reason. It's stock, street, and race. This one is not where we belong on this channel, okay? Someday I will build a race mount, I promise but you are dealing with stock and street when we're talking about all of this. With that being said right here, I have a 750 Holley because I don't have anything big enough to put it on and it's just been sitting on the shelf for a bajillion years. A very typical carburetor. This should be a good test mule here for showing uh, what we're talking about as we go through this list. We're gonna go through the base tuning procedure, talk about the anomalies and we'll get to this uh, here in a bit. But what I'm essentially doing today is we're gonna discuss what's going to happen while it's quiet and then I'm going to go through this list actively with you guys on this blazer and get this thing running. Reason is, this is a perfect example of you just bought a car and it runs bad. There's no base tuning has been done to it. It doesn't idle. It, it's exactly this scenario. So with that being said, let's get started. So base tuning procedures. There's a reason we're gonna go through this list first on every single vehicle and carburetor you come across. Reason is, this is Schrodinger's carburetor, okay? We don't know what jets are in here. We don't know where anything's set. We don't know what power valve it has. We don't know what squirter sizes. We don't know what secondary springs. We don't know what accelerator pump cams. We don't know the secondary jets. We don't know the power valve restrictors. We don't know the air restrictors. There's a ton of stuff going on inside this beautiful little machine. And until we literally observe it, we cannot assume what it is. Brand, brand, brand new carburetors. I'm not saying carburetors bought from someone else that were uh, brand new and never installed when you bought them, but brand new ones that you take out of the box, you can assume what's in them because they should be exactly what it says on the tech card or on the Summit or Holly's website. They will list all your jet sizes, all your power valves, everything down in the description so you don't have to tear it apart. Plus, you know, no one's screwed with them before, like ran your mix screws all the way in and mushroomed them out and ruined them so they'll never flow correctly. This application for the blazer and for what I have in my hand is a perfect scenario of what you will find in the wild, Schrodinger's carburetor, we don't know what's going on. So with that being said, it is time to find out what's going on and set everything exactly where we want it so we know our starting point and we can make changes later on based off of this. To do all this today, you're gonna to need a couple things. You're going to need a vacuum gauge. These are the good ones if you can find this. It's actually got some sweet uh, little tips and tricks right there in the gauge that if you're ever stuck and you see this gauge doing something weird, right usually next to where it's doing that weird thing, it'll have a description like late valve timing or a leak at intake manifold or heat riser. I think that is a Harbor Freight gauge if I remember right. Second thing you're gonna need is a timing light. Uh, this is mine, it's been used a lot to help together with tape. I prefer these dial style uh, timing lights because when it comes time to check your total timing, you have to rev your engine up a whole bunch and then find that mark, which I can do this fast. I can switch from, you know, zero to 60, just like that, where the guys with the buttons are like, 41, 44, 50. Meanwhile, their engine's sitting there screaming at three grand. On top of that, it's never a bad idea to go down to O'Reilly's and get a rebuild kit for your carburetor because even if you don't use anything, carry it around in the glove box because there's a chance someday that you might need something and you just have it on you. The only other special things I can think of besides that, you're going to want to get a wire brush and some white or green or vibrant color paint to mark our harmonic balancer, which is step one on our engine, mark that harmonic balancer. So. Let's go ahead, start into our list here. Number one, initial timing. Mark zero to 10 degrees, depending on what kind of light you have on your balancer. Uh, if you have this style light with the advance, just mark zero. If you have one without advance, mark uh, either 10 or whatever you want to set your initial timing to, put the mark there. If you have a digital one, mark zero as well. So I'm gonna go find some paint and we'll do that. All right, welcome to underneath the truck. I got a nice deep well socket on here. Got up 
into the harmonic balancer and turn the motor over. Uh, if you have a Ford, it's going to be a 15 16 socket always. If you have a Chevy, good luck. Today's flavor was 5 8 Either way, I rolled the motor over until I could see some kind of obvious mark on the harmonic, which is that little crack right there in the center of the screen. Uh, it lines up with their timing tabs, so I went ahead and cleaned it up. And now I'll go ahead and put some white paint on that right there. Now it should be said that there's multiple styles of these uh, timing indicators. There, at the tip of my finger shadow, assuming you can see that, I have absolutely no idea. Somewhere in that vicinity, there's some tiny little tabs, and I can't even tell which one zero is on this motor. Shit, this is going to be a problem. <laughs> Let's get a better example. All right, here we go. Same deal. Uh, there will be a mark on this pulley right here somewhere, and then these tabs will have numbers on them. And one of them will be zero, and he's the guy that we want to pay attention to. If you're fortunate enough to work on a Ford, they give you one tab, which is that little guy right there in the center of the screen. And then the harmonic itself will have the numbers on it. Right here, this guy will have numbers on him. And then you can mark your zero on the harmonic instead of trying to clean that tab off and mark zero. Either way, I'm gonna get some white paint to mark that because it's gonna make it a lot, lot easier to see with the timing light, especially when we're outside tuning, which is where the majority of this happens. If you don't have any uh, paint pens, much like myself, go ahead and just fill the cap of your spray paint bottle with a little white paint. You get a screwdriver, and now you get yourself a paintbrush. I used to have a paint pen, but it ran out in like 2016, and I've just literally never got a new one. All right, well, no idea if you guys can really even see it at all, but there's some teeth right there. And one of them is different. <laughs> that one's zero. I've got that marked with paint, and likewise underneath here, I've got one side of my crack just kind of highlighted so I can see it with paint. If you guys hook up your timing light and you got some crazy shit happening to where yeah, you can't even see that dot that we just marked uh, near your tab, chances are you're probably on the wrong plug wire, or you might have marked uh, if it's a crack like that one, they're not quite as accurate as when there's just a number because you can't get a number wrong. But you may have marked the wrong crack because some of them are for machining or for balance, or there's a chance that something's wrong with the motor itself, such as someone put the wrong harmonic on, wrong timing tab on, or uh, the harmonic since it's a rubber isolated ring on the outside could have even slipped. I've never run into any of that. It's either me putting the dot on the wrong spot on the harmonic, wrong crack, or me putting the induction lead on the wrong plug wire. Either way, this is kind of what I was seeing except for zero was cut a little deeper. It was like back here so that you could tell which one zero was. You're going to have generally uh, 20 to zero uh, before top dead center and then zero to 10 after top dead center. So make sure you're at zero, not 10. If you just go to the lowest point, that's not actually zero and all your stuff's gonna be 10 degrees off. All right, step one is done. We've got her marked off. Uh, there are a couple more anomalies there than I thought there were gonna be, but I wanna make this the most inclusive uh, tuning video I've done to date. So we're gonna talk about all the weird shit as we go to help you guys out if this really is your first time doing this so you know what to expect. Either way, this is done. We've got our paint on our harmonic balancer that make it easy to see in the daylight. Let's go ahead and move on to step two where we are going to disconnect the vacuum advance line. Really should have done this on a Ford. They're a bit easier to work on. <laughs> so step two, unplug the distributor vacuum advance line. Here's our distributor. This is the vacuum advance canister. He has a line coming off of him running to either manifold or a ported vacuum, we'll get into that later. We're going to unplug him, make sure he doesn't get into the fan or into uh, an exhaust thing, and oh, there's a nice leak. And then I'm going to get a vacuum cap, and we're gonna cap off that right there so we don't have a vacuum leak. Perfect. All right, vacuum advance line is disconnected and we have it capped off, so there is no vacuum leak. At this point, we're gonna try to fire the car up. If this is a car that's been running, you should have no problems here. If this is a first start and you just installed your distributor, here's a video from Luke on how to do that, uh, you're gonna probably have to play with that distributor a bit to get this thing to fire up because who knows where it really landed versus where you wanted it to land exactly. Once we get it running smooth, I'm going to turn our distributor and set our initial timing somewhere from about eight to 15 degrees uh, on a stock or mild cam. Now, manufacturer recommendations are probably gonna be lower than that. They'll probably be like six, eight, 10. Those guys have to put warranties on stuff. We don't. <laughs> We're gonna throw a little more at it and get a little more efficiency, a little more power out of it. 
So let's go do it. So unfortunately, this is not a great vehicle to demonstrate using the timing light and like watching it move because I can barely see the timing mark. I don't know how I'm even gonna time this thing. But uh, moral of the story, I'm gonna take this guy right here, put him down there on the cylinder number one, plug wires close to the plug as you can get them. Make sure his cord is not gonna get tangled up in anything, such as the fan or an exhaust manifold where it will melt. Take these guys, put them on your positive and negative battery terminals respectively. And then somehow, magically, loosen your distributor bolt so that you can turn it back and forth. If your engine's been sitting for a long time, or especially as a coolant link around that distributor shaft, there's a good chance it's froze and it might take a little massaging or convincing to get it to rotate again. Just soak it down in some PB blaster. Uh, just lightly tap it with a, a dead blow or a, a mallet on the on the advance to try to try to get it moving or if you can go all out and remove it all the way if you need to hopefully that's not the case today or for you guys and this thing's going to want to spin and we can easily set our timing once we get this fired up what you're going to see me do is take this timing gun and point it at a really ridiculous angle somewhere like there i think what it's going to do is every time it senses a spark on that number one plug wire, it's going to flash a bulb. At that same time, that mark we made down there will be coming past uh, the timing tab and it will act as a perfectly timed strobe light so that we see a bunch of individual pictures essentially with our eyes by having one illuminated frame, if you will. In doing so, we'll be able to see where in relation to that plug firing the uh, harmonic balancer is positioned and how many degrees before top dead center or after dead center our timing is. Once I can see that dot and it's a single lighted frame of imagery, I'm going to turn this dial until that dot lines up perfectly with the mark. At that point, I will read the number on here and know that that is currently what our timing is set to. If our timing turns out to be at say like three or five degrees, which is what I'm anticipating, uh, I'm going to move this dial till about the 13 that we want. Go ahead and shine my light down there again, reach in and turn my distributor until those marks line up once again, and we'll be set at that value. It's that simple. Let's go ahead and fire this thing up and do exactly that. So one thing I'm expecting to see happen here is that when I dial this in, our uh, idle's gonna jump up really high. Don't worry, that will be in the upcoming steps. A lot of people think you set your idle with your curb idle screw, or as we call it, the transfer slot screw. Uh, you do not. You set that to a square, which we will get to, and then you dial in your idle with your timing, essentially. It's, it's all a balancing act that keeps just going over and over. I'll show you. Right now we're at 15 degrees initial. Perfect. So when I unbolted that, I bumped the distributor and I must have advanced it a little bit because now this truck wants to idle. I think it was sitting at about eight or less earlier. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and get my wrench and tighten the distributor back down and we'll move on to the next step because our initial timing is set and confirmed to be where we want it to. We can check that off the board of mysteries. Okay, so we've got our initial timing dialed into 13 degrees. We can move on to the next step. At this point, we need to do a safety measure and test our total timing. In quick form, uh, as you rev your engine up, there's weights in your distributor that move and advance the timing for you because the fuel is always burning at the same rate, but you need to start the explosion faster to keep up with the now accelerated piston speed because your engine is speeding up and fuel still burns at the same speed. You start the explosion sooner and that peak power point can be utilized better and that's where power comes from is timing. With that being said, now that we're messing with our timing and we're going to be putting uh, more timing in in the bottom of our full duration of where it's allowed to move, we move everything up a little bit. So we need to check our total timing and make sure that our total timing does not continue on to like 45 degrees. If it does, we either need to put stop bushings in or we need to lower our initial timing to bring that back down into a respectable number. This is just a safety precaution, but it's something you do 
to base your initial timing off of. Let's say we have 30 degrees of mechanical advance and we are idling at uh, 5 degrees initial, which I suspect this was at prior. When we get up into the RPM, we won't have a problem because we'll probably only be at 35 degrees total timing. But now that we just threw another 10 degrees of initial timing, it's going to take that same 30 degree slot and move it from 5 to 35 to 15 to 45 and that might be too much timing to safely run in this engine. So to check this, I'm gonna bring the engine up to about eh, three grand, use my dial light really quick, see what our total timing is, and if it's too high, we'll pull some initial timing out, or you can run uh, stop bushings. If you have a big cam or large carburetor that wants that extra initial timing to idle or run properly down low. I don't have any stop bushings for an HEI on me, so if it's too high, we will just take five degrees too much on the top end out of the initial and bring it down to 10 instead of the 13 or 15 that it's at now. I think it's 13. All right, Jesse, fire it up. Fire it up without an accelerator pump now. Oh, big sad. Did you do that? Huh? Did you do that? No. Go ahead. Hang on. Chuck ran out of gas. At the very top of that tuning board, I should put make sure there's adequate fuel in the tank. Like I know what's wrong with it. Ain't got no gas in it. <laughs> this is like the third time this has happened to me. All right, five gallons of gas. Uh, that should make a difference. <laughs> Hang on, what? joys of an HEI distributor. This engine is currently running with two whopping degrees of mechanical advance. I'm assuming that was about four grand. We're seeing 15 instead of 13. That right there is the other reason we check total time is to make sure that our distributor is properly functioning and that uh, it is pulling timing advance, which in this case it is absolutely not. So we're going to take a pause from our carburetor tuning uh, list over there and I'm going to figure out what's going on with that distributor, I'm expecting stuck weights, a bad weight spring design, because it's an HEI and they suck. Okay, let's get that figured out and get our total timing dialed in. So if you haven't seen the episode where we worked on Dad's truck and I talked about distributors and why a uh, name brand distributor is a good idea because of the better quality uh, and an eBay, uh, especially eBay HEI style distributor is a terrible idea. I mentioned that I've come across a lot of HEI distributors that do exactly this. They pull no mechanical timing. Most of the time at idle, they're already hanging at essentially full advance and they have no choice and they have no ability to add more. If I had to guess, I'm going to pop this off and our springs are gonna be all sorts of sad underneath. Oh no. Oh, the cap wasn't even bolted down all the way. That's good. <laughs> okay, how much sad are we talking? Oh, yeah, look at that. They're literally on top of each other right now. Like, what the? <laughs> this is why I don't like stock aftermarket any style HEI distributors because of these shitty cam and weight designs. Look at this. Look at this. What more proof do I need? So I'm gonna have to redo our timing because of this because if you look, here's what's happening. You speed your engine up and these weights swing out. They're supposed to easily swing out. This is taking a considerable amount of force, but they will swing out and advance that cap in relation to the internals of the motor and advance your timing. But when they sit like this, they actually retard your cap and you will have absolutely no ability to move your timing, make no power, run like crap, and just have a generalized bad time. So yeah, we need to fix that before we can go any farther and have any hopes of tuning this because once I get that fixed, we're starting back at the top of the list initial timing. Let's do it. So as you can tell, what's going on here is that these bushings have completely worn out. But the other issue I'm facing, beyond just replacing those bushings, is the amount of force it takes to move this. That should be really easy to move. It isn't. <laughs> Feels like I'm trying to push Play-Doh through a garden hose, if that makes any sense at all. <laughs> Let's get the PB blaster and the brake clean, see if we can get it to spin better and find new bushings. 
We've got the clips off this top plate so we can pop him off. There we go. Really clean up everything underneath. This is not the first one of these I've had to do this to. Oh, that's better already. Alright, stall the spring set off of that Summit distributor that does not fit. Come on. Play nice. Go on, you son of a bitch. There we go. These pins are a little worn, but as far as I can tell, you know what, Ashley? They're they're perfect. We're good to go. Yeah, look at this. This dumb design. All right, there we go. That looks a lot better. It's it's mostly tight here in the center, so it shouldn't fly open at idle. But <laughs> we'll see. Let's get this on tight again. So I don't know how long you guys can see it. But our our uh, timing is kind of all over the place right now. So I bring it up. There, see it running away. And you can hear it. The truck's all over the place. That's five degrees initial. What I think is happening is our transfer slots are way too far open. And it's getting way too much RPM and opening those weights up. We'll get to setting this properly later, but for now, I'm just going to turn it way down. Oh, much better. Yeah, those were cranked way open. So now I should be able to set our initial timing finally. To be fair, the first three items on the list can be done in any order. Sometimes you want to start with your transfer slots. Sometimes we'll start with your timing. It all depends on if it's running or the shit. This one was not. When I started the timing, I should have set my transfer slots first. See if I can get it about eight. Okay, there's eight degrees and it's not running away. We're getting places. <laughs> now, back to what we were doing like an hour and a half ago. Let's see if that dot moves when I rev it up. See if our timing advance works. Look at that, what do you know? We got about 28 degrees of total timing. Pretty okay. My throttle is hanging open. Let's give it a little more. Pretty up to about 10. So, initial timing's done, total timing's checked. We've got about 30 degrees total. We're sitting at 10 degrees initial, and look, it's sitting here idle and happy already. And we've still got the work to do from here to get it even better. So while we're in here getting our timing and everything dialed in, I'm just gonna knock out number two real quick, make sure everything's happy. This is our float height. On this Demon carburetor, you have this nice glass sight gauge, and we can see that it's right in the middle. Too low, too high, right in the middle. To change that, we would loosen this screw, and turn this nut. Chances are that it's going to rip that gasket and you're going to need to replace that gasket while you're in there. On an older style Holly, there is no glass sight gauge. There is this screw right here. All you do is take him out when your engine is idling. Get a rag under here or something. And make sure that the gas is right at the bottom of those threads. Right at the bottom of that hole. Same deal here. Loosen the big screw on top and turn the nut underneath, and that will adjust your float height. Tighten it all back down, pray to the gods above that it doesn't leak. If it does, get a new gasket, and you're good to go. So that's step two. Let's go set our transfer slots quick. Okay, so we've got our initial timing finally set. Like I said, don't know if you could hear me over there when I said it. These first three, depending on what gets your car to run well enough to set your timing, can be swapped around. I know Luke likes to start with his transfer slots, which is you literally flip this upside down, Make sure you push this little red lever up for the choke and then come in right here and set your transfer slots to a square. When I'm talking about transfer slots, I'm talking about that long rectangle right there. I want to set that blade till only a square shows. There's two ways to do that. You can take the carburetor off and set that manually and you do it with the curb idle screw, the transfer slot screw. Or you can use a vacuum gauge and leave the carburetor on the vehicle, saves a little time 
slash. If you're not comfortable with taking the carb off, this is the way to go. So step one is to find your ported vacuum port. One of these is gonna be manifold, which means it's below the throttle blades. And the other one is ported, which means it's above the throttle blades. But I'm gonna hook my gauge up and I'm gonna fire this up and make sure this gauge does not move. If it does, that means we're exposing too much transfer slot and exposing that upper port that's above the throttle blades. I'll crank the throttle up so you guys can see what it'll look like if it's wrong. And then we will turn that screw down until this just sets down on zero and any little input will bring it up. So let's go do that, we'll go fire it up. Okay, so right now it's properly set. I'm gonna show you what it would look like if it's wrong. Essentially, if you hook this up to your timed vacuum port or your ported vacuum port, you will see if it's too far open, you will see this move the tiniest bit or even a bunch. It'll be somewhere in that range. What you want to do, turn your idle down until this guy just stops at zero. But less jumpy because, you know, it's a screw, not my tongue. Either way, our first three are done, and it's time to move on to adjusting our mixture screws, the fun stuff. Okay, final step here for our tuning procedure. I've got our vacuum gauge, and I'm going to hook it to manifold vacuum this time. We've got our vacuum in advance and everything else hooked up to the point where this is how this car will run when it's on the road. What I'm gonna do is fire this up. I'm going to be turning my mixture screws. This is a four corner idle, so I've got four of these things I gotta deal with. Uh, first things first, go ahead and take them all the way in. You don't want to ram them in, you just want to feel them touch. I'm going to take them all two turns out, which should be plenty rich. And then I'm going to keep turning those in farther and farther. And what it's going to do is make this needle both steadier and higher. And I want to turn those in until I get the highest uh, reading on this gauge. And then I know that we're running the best, which means that's at its peak efficiency point, which means we're burning the most, the, the proper amount of fuel. I also want to make sure this engine's nice and warm and the carb is it's nice and warm because if I do this on a cold motor and then I go drive and the engine heat soaks in here, you're gonna actually be lean. So usually at this point you've been doing timing and all this stuff and the motor's completely up to temp, which is literally the case here, so we're good to go. Alright, here we go. It's gonna run like ass till I get it tuned up. Uh, you know how sloppy that needle is? You can already see that we're much smoother and much higher, so I'm going to give each one another quarter turn here. Oh yeah, now we're making some progress. So what I want to do go past my highest point to know that I've really truly made it to the highest and then as I get too lean the needle's gonna drop and then I'll find that center between too lean and too rich. Oh, well, like that. Clear it out every once in a while. down. There we go. We got a nice steady needle for how worn out this old motor is. Pretty much any movements I make are just making it bad. So I, I think that's it folks. The last step is double check your timing because now that your idle set is probably going to be different from where you started. About eight. My idles are down, so we're gonna give it a touch more. So there we go, we got a nice steady vacuum gauge. Perfect 20 inches of mercury. Chuck's been sitting here running for like eight minutes while I dialed that in. That's a tuned carburetor just by going through our base tuning procedure.
At this point, we'll talk about some weird anomalies with carburetors that you might have to account for. And we'll talk about what's going on when you're driving a carburetor and how to tune those. Okay, so now that we've got everything done for our base tuning procedures, there are a couple things I want to go over for anomalies. This is like I had mentioned earlier, you're trying to make it work with what you have, or you have an application that is going to have a bigger carb, or a large cam, or slash just some other things I want to mention for issues you may run into. We've already seen a great one today was that HEI distributor was junk, so we have to replace that. Let's start off on the top, too much carb. What you would think when you have too large of a carb is that your engine is going to run too rich because big carb, big fuel. Actually, completely the opposite thing is going to happen. The carburetor draws fuel from the booster by utilizing what is called a Venturi effect, and these are literally called the Venturis. What's happening is you have a shape like this, and you have the same amount of air flowing here and here and thusly here. This is a similar concept to what airplanes use to fly. You force the same amount of air over a, a longer path. It's going to create lift in the case of an aircraft, but this one's kind of the other way around. So we're going to create vacuum right here in this pinch. Well, right there is where our booster sits, which is this guy right here. With that being said, the more air we move through this small little hole, the more vacuum we create and the more fuel we can draw out. There's four of those on a carburetor, not just one. And an engine can only move so much air. So if you put such a big carburetor on, that now this Venturi is like this damn big, you're going to have very little vacuum in this center bit here that's becoming a mess. But the larger that Venturi is, the more air it needs to rush through it to pull the appropriate amount of vacuum and thusly the appropriate amount of fuel. If you get a carburetor that wants 800 CFM of air through it, but your engine can only mechanically produce 550 CFM, you're not going to have enough air or enough vacuum at that booster to pull the appropriate amount of fuel and you will thusly be starving your engine of fuel and run lean. A little bit backwards concept from what you would think. So that's what happens when you have too big of a carburetor. Your vacuum signal right here becomes a mess. It's a nightmare to tune and it's just lean all across the board. Next thing to consider, large cam motors. A large cam is designed to live up top, breathe a lot of air up top. Down low you have large valve overlap, large uh, durations, large lobes lift and that will actually hurt your idle uh, vacuum levels. So instead of seeing somewhere around like 20, like what you should see on a nice healthy small motor, you'll probably live somewhere around 10 to 15 on your um, vacuum gauge at idle. Once again, that's gonna be just like the large Venturi and you're not gonna have as much vacuum signal at the booster and it's not gonna pull fuel as efficiently. Alongside that, you're going to have less of a uh, dense fuel charge in your cylinder basically there's less air getting in there and when you have less air you need more initial timing to help burn that more efficiently so what you're gonna have to do if you have a large cam or even a street cam is you're gonna have to put more initial timing so we were sitting at 8 to 15 before you might see 15 to 20 now to get that engine to idle appropriately you may also need to open your transfer slot a little bit just a touch to help to kind of band-aid that keep it running uh, one thing you can do is you can switch to manifold vacuum instead of ported, which at idle will pull timing, will add timing to your initial timing, whereas ported is only adding timing when the throttle blades are open a little bit. Now, with that extra initial timing set mechanically by you turning the distributor, we're going to have a ton of total timing. You might be looking at 60 degrees and nothing, nothing is going to run at 60 degrees of timing. That's where stop bushings come in. Those are really important. Big cams are going to make more power, but they're also going to require more work to get set up. Next on the list, power valves. Something I often see people run into with power valves is power valves have a value on them. You can have a five and a half, six and a half, an eight and a half, ten and a half. That number on the back of the power valve, it's right around the ring, that number does not indicate a flow of any type. People usually go, oh, it's running a little, a little lean right here with the power valves opening. I'll put a bigger power valve in. I'll put a ten and a half in instead of an eight. That's not how that works. It doesn't flow any more fuel. A power valve is simply an on-off switch for a gate further down the line, which is your power valve restrictors. 
those control your fuel flow. The value on the power valve simply controls when on this vacuum gauge it will open in correspondence to whatever number is both being produced by the engine in inches of mercury and written on the back of that power valve. An eight and a half will open anywhere below eight and a half inches of mercury because the uh, vacuum is no longer able to overcome the spring and keep it closed. Another note to add about power valves, ouch, <laughs> it bit me, is that they go bad over time and they do that without leaking sometimes. You've seen trucks on the channel that sat for 20 years, we fire it up, it doesn't idle and it just chugs black smoke because the power valve uh, diaphragm has failed and it's just, the spring is just forcing it open and it's just dumping all that en enrichment level of fuel at idle, not where it belongs. It should be way up here. However, sometimes they go bad without leaking, by which I mean, and I've seen this, especially if it, you have an AFR, you can really see this happening. That diaphragm becomes stiff. Perfect example, my orange truck here sat for about a year, year and a half. Still drove fine, but I noticed this weird lean spot right where my power valve was supposed to be opening around eight, and it wasn't opening until about five inches of mercury, which means that that diaphragm had become stiff and therefore changed the value of the power valve. That's just something to keep an eye out for and you'll really only see it if you have an AFR gauge. But generally the moral of the story there is change your power valves if your car sits or even every few years. Accelerator pumps, very similar story. They go bad over time. This gasket right here will blow out and start leaking all the time or become too stiff and it's like <clears throat> instead of just moving nice and free. Right here, that little green plastic block, that is the accelerator pump cam. Now there's all sorts of different colors of these and those colors refer to the profile of the cam and they change how much fuel is given by changing how much this arm moves. You can see that's full lift and I still have more left there. So a bigger pump cam would open that up more and they have different ramping profiles that change the timing of when that fuel is delivered. There are two positions right here. The screw is what holds that accelerator pump camshaft in place. You have a one and a two. Two is actually the smaller shot of the two. Uh, it's not changing so much the height, it's changing the speed at which the fuel is induced in the engine. Holly themselves says that if you're idling below 900 RPM, stock motor, you're probably gonna want that at one. If you're idling above 1000 RPM, 900 to 1000 RPM, bigger camshaft, a little bit built motor, you're probably gonna wanna set that on two. We just kinda use it as like a half adjustment sometimes when it's like, oh, the next pump shot cam size is too big, let's try two instead of one. Next on the list, secondary springs. Uh, similar to pump cams, there's different color springs you can put in here. The black is the strongest, meaning that it takes the most amount of Venturi vacuum to overcome the spring, thusly opening these secondaries automatically the slowest. Whoop. Those are your secondaries coming open. If you're suspect of your secondaries not coming open, you can put a paper clip here and see if he slides down after a hard pull. But I can tell you that right now, this one's no good because this diaphragm's hanging out all ripped up. If this diaphragm has any kind of a hole in it, your secondaries will not open. So inspect that diaphragm when you're in there. We generally run the black spring in all of our cars because we do mild street cars or stock vehicles, like I've said a thousand times today. Those open the slowest, but they give you a nice, uh, easily tunable fuel curve and a nice easy dip into your secondary barrels back here. You can test uh, your secondaries with compressed air. You follow this little line right here, essentially from here into the carb, there is a port right about there. There's an O-ring right there. Check that guy as well when you have it apart. But I can't really show you on this carb. There is a hole just below, uh, just below that Venturi, there's a hole. If you take your air compressor nozzle and hold it just right, you will activate the vacuum in this Venturi. If you get enough airflow, it'll overcome that spring, and you can watch your secondaries literally open. Great way to test them. Last on the list of anomalies, your choke. When you are setting your transfer slots, which is a step we did earlier on the engine, uh, a lot of people, I've seen this on Facebook all the time, they'll flip their carburetor over, or even sometimes on the truck when the truck's cold with an automatic choke, and they open it up, and they drop it. What they'll say is no matter how much I adjust my transfer slot screw, curve idle screw, it's not even touching and I can't get these to be a square. Well, here's your problem. This little red tab right here, push him down and that will turn your choke off. I'll show you from below. I'm gonna press that tab. 
See how it went closed further? Now you can set your transfer slots to a square. All right, so we have done our base tuning procedures. We know our carburetor is set up to a nice, brisk perfectness of standard. <laughs> it is idling fine, and it has the ability to drive us around just great. Here's where the real tuning comes in, which I'm not going to be able to show you very precisely on this vehicle because there's no AFR gauge, but I am going to talk about it quick. Before me, I have drawn what I call the ladder diagram of the internal functions of a carburetor, which are all based on vacuum. And if you know anything about an engine, you know that everything we've been doing all day has been about vacuum. To summarize that, because I didn't really talk about it earlier, imagine taking a shot back and turning it on and putting your hand over the end of the hose. Now inside that tube, you have created a vacuum. There's no air in it and it's sucking really hard. Take your hand off the tube and air is able to flow. The vacuum level in that tube decreases to zero because air is flowing. It's all going down into the bucket of the vacuum. We now have no vacuum in this tube. As I modulate that, I can raise and lower the levels of vacuum in that tube by it always sucking just as hard, but me modulating the amount of air allowed into the tube. Now, replace that shot back with an engine and replace my hand with the throttle blades of a carburetor. Moral of the story there, the different uh, cycles of a carburetor, if you will, the different systems are controlled off of vacuum level in the engine. These systems do so in a compounding matter. Each one that's activated by the next level of vacuum we've just reached adds fuel to the last one. They compound, they add up, they act like a ladder. Down here we have idle, up here at the top of the ladder we have wide open throttle. On a nice healthy motor when it's sitting here idling we're going to be pulling about 20 inches of mercury. Your hand is all the way over the tube of the shot back. The only thing metering the amount of fuel at idle into our engine is the mixture screws. It's these guys right here on this holly. Some carbs have a second metering plate in the back and they have four corner mixture screws, four corner idle. Either way, we are sitting here idling at a nice clean 20 inches of vacuum. None of these other systems have been activated because the high volume of vacuum in the bottom of the carburetor is holding all of these diaphragms or gates closed. In a perfect world, we're somewhere around 13 to 13 and a half if we had an AFR gauge in the vehicle. If you don't have an AFR gauge, it's just like we did on that truck. It's all about getting this needle as far to this green line as you can by turning those mixture screws and making it run as clean as possible. Clean is correct, correct is more vacuum. Moral of the story here though is that we are at the first rung of the ladder. Changing any of these other circuits in the carburetor is not going to affect our idle at all. It's just going to screw things up later. The only thing that's going to change this exact AFR value is turning our mixture screws. So our truck's sitting there running good, but it's time to go. We pull it down into gear, we hit the road. We're just, just the throttle's open. We're doing anywhere from 5 to 40 mile an hour under a light load. There's no headwind or anything like that. Our vacuum gauge is sitting somewhere around, you know, 15 to 20, depending on engine uh, characteristics per specific engine. That'll move around a bit. But we are not into any point of the power valve. Or we got still plenty of vacuum on this gauge. We're just, we're just cruising. We're just heading into town to get a sandwich. Right now we are pulling a little fuel through our mixture screws, but most of the fuel we're burning is now coming from our primary jets. Right here in the front of the carburetor, all of our fuel is coming out of these two booster legs right here from our primary jets in the front bowl. Ideally, we're running around, I don't know, let's just say 12.8 for this. Before anyone wants to argue with the 14.7 stoic and you should be driving down the road at 14.7, what color is 14.7 on your AFR gauge if it's red, yellow, and green? It's yellow. <laughs> Anything above about 13 and a half turns yellow because it's too lean. Sure, the average of your engine in the exhaust is 14.7, but that means you have at least probably four cylinders at the outside of your engine running leaner than that, and that's dangerous. And who likes average? <laughs> Thanks, Jesse. <laughs> we like to run down the road at about 12.8 to 13.5. Either way, the point is, if we are around this level of vacuum and your AFR is off, be it too rich or too lean, you need to make a change to your primary jets because your vacuum is currently only operating this circuit and this circuit. And we know that we're already good at idle. Our first rung is set. So if we're on the second rung of the ladder, and it's got a loose screw, we're not gonna go tighten a screw on the first rung or on the third rung. We're gonna tighten the screw on the second rung and change our primary jet size to dial in that AFR ratio. 
Throughout this whole ladder, we have this little uh, addition of fuel called the accelerator pump. And at any time that you move your throttle down, you will be adding more fuel. So even if you're driving down the road and you open it up more, or you're at idle and you open it up to drive down the road, a little mechanical shot of fuel will be thrown into wherever you are. You can actually watch that on an AFR gauge as you activate that accelerator pump, it'll dip around in either direction, usually a little rich, um, and then it'll mellow back out to where it is. But that's just something to keep in mind. If everything's fine, but you stomp on the gas and it gets suddenly rich for just a split second or suddenly lean and coughs for a split second, you need to make an adjustment to your accelerator pump because that's a very momentary change. The problem is people use an accelerator pump as a band-aid to fix uh, a problem with their ladder here. Anyway, back on track. We've got our sandwich. We're heading home. We're really excited to eat it. We're gonna hammer on it and get out of town. We're not gonna put it on the floor, but we're gonna like, I, I, need, to, I need to get on this on-ramp. You're gonna put your foot down pretty far and we're gonna only pull about five to 10 inches of mercury in that carburetor and in your engine. At this point, depending on the value of your power valve, any um, vacuum reading less than the number written on the back of your power valve will allow that power valve to open. It uses vacuum to hold itself closed, but as you remove vacuum from the engine by opening and throttle up more, a spring will push itself back open and it will add supplemental fuel. You're now doing more RPM than just what the primary jets can fuel, so it's a little splash from a bucket constantly. On an AFR gauge, this is gonna look like a drop. You're gonna be riding around at 12.8. You're gonna hit the throttle, watch the vacuum come down below the measured value of your power valve, and you will see it get richer. Clean spot right there, up around 10 still. Watch it get rich as I hit six and a half, right? Power valve. If you get way too rich or still too lean at that point, what you can do is change your restrictors or drill them out and solder them and make them smaller or drill them out and leave them larger. And that will change the fuel quantity that your power valve is adding. The value on the power valve is only when it opens. It does not have anything to do with the amount of fuel, just the timing of the set fuel controlled by the restrictors. At this point, we can see home on the horizon and we really, really want this sandwich and it is time to haul ass. You can't wait any longer, you put your foot on the floor. You are at wide open throttle. Your vacuum gauge is at zero. Your hand is completely off that shot back tube and it is just <laughs> air, all right? It is time to open the floodgates. As the air rushing through on a vacuum secondary, me uh, mechanicals just do it with a linkage over here. But as the air rushing through your primary barrels becomes high enough, there's a little hole up here that runs off Venturi vacuum that will overcome a spring in this canister and open your back two barrels. At this point, it is everything your carburetor's got. We're feeding that tiny little bit off the mixtures. The primaries are going ham. The power valve is still wide open because we're still well below that point for the power valve to come open. And now your secondaries are flowing air and those boosters are pulling fuel as well. If at this point, your AFR is off, guess which one you need to make a change to? Your secondary jets. If it's too lean, put a bigger secondary jet in. If it's too rich, put a smaller secondary jet in. There's no point in messing with any of this if your problem only exists there. And that sentence right there is the whole point of why I talked about any of this and why I drew up this ladder. If you're only having an AFR issue after a certain vacuum level, that last circuit that activated is the one that needs changed. You're not gonna put in bigger primary jets if it's only rich at wide open throttle. You're gonna mess with your secondaries. The fuel circuits in a carburetor are compounding and add to the one before them and are activated by whatever level of vacuum is in the engine. As I may have mentioned earlier, we've talked about this before. Um, if you guys didn't see that video with the camper a long, long time ago where I explained this at a kitchen table with a screwdriver, I did it again today because I have a dry erase marker this time. So if you didn't understand it then or didn't see it then, I hope you guys were able to catch up and either figure it out now or see it for the first time. It's been a year since we talked about it. It is a very, 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 very critical step to understanding how a carburetor works is separating those four circuits into four different compounding rungs. So with that being said, let's move on to the next thing.